our continuing series of conference interviews from the Cryptocurrency Conference in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, today we're joined by Peter Serta, who is the primary at the Economics of Bitcoin blog. That's and right. what oh, I actually should ask you this, what formal title or how would you like to be introduced? Because I know some of your projects, but I'm sure you have other projects. Well, I, I, th this is a difficult topic because I haven't really, I, I've had many job titles. Uh, most of my life I've been doing programming and sysadmin work, but I have a formal education in business administration on the other hand and ho had also some law and economics in that. And uh, now people think that I'm a Bitcoin economist, so I decided to play along. Like, why not? Fair enough. And that is what one of your business cards says. It says, yeah. Bitcoin economist. So you write a lot about the Austrian school, and you've been writing a lot about Bitcoin. So for our listeners, why is Bitcoin something that's desirable for, from an Austrian point of view at a very high level? This actually depends on which of the branches uh, is concerned. But the main branch, I'll actually have, uh, have that in my talk. The main branch basically argues that uh, the ideal money is uh, money that has an inelastic supply of base money and that there is a full reserve banking. And with Bitcoin, Bitcoin is a base, well, wannabe money with uh, inelastic supply and it tackles the fractional reserve banking in an unexpected manner and that is that uh, there is very little demand for uh, deposit banking, what's called. So how the Austrians depict the fractional reserve banking, that it's a combination of mediating loans and deposit banking. When the deposit banking goes away, there's technically a full reserve banking because there's no, the, the money supply is equal to the monetary base. This is an unusual thing that never existed before, but I think Lawrence White He's one of the, the Austrians. He made an argument that explains that uh, this is an empirical issue. So he might have thought that hypothetically something like that is possible. So there's definitely a divide within the libertarian community and sort of as, as you sort of started getting into as in the mindset, you know, and how people look at libertarianism versus and that how that influences how they're looking at Bitcoin. The stance that I take a lot of the time and I think a lot of people who I know take is that it's very bad for the perfect to be the enemy of the good and that if you sit around and wait for a solution that solves every single problem you're going to be waiting a long time and that there are partial solutions out there is it ideological purity that has to do with it this is actually a very interesting point because uh, bitcoin basically tackles this problem from a slightly different angle that has existed so far at least in the minds of economists so it might not be perfect, like we know that there are all kinds of problems with it, but some of the problems that were thought to be either unsolvable or difficult to solve, it solves in a very easy way. And uh, so, so, so the question is actually what the correct combination of the, the features of ideal money is, because uh, we probably can't have a perfect money that is everything in an ideal way, but there are two questions which of the, the feature sets is uh, more desirable than the others. And the second one is whether that actually will work in reality and sustain itself. Do you think that the conversation is changing as we move forward in time? I mean, is the fact that Bitcoin continues to exist sort of disproving a lot of the, a lot of the skepticism? The, the, you're actually taking stuff right out of my lecture. So. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, basically, my impression is that it's kind of like what uh, what is ascribed to Gandhi, like first they ignore you, then sure. they laugh at you, then they fight you, and then you win. So with uh, Bitcoin, it's kind of like first it's being ignored and laughed at, then uh, economists uh, simply say quickly that it can't work or it won't work, but it's still there. So then the next step is they make reasons to explain why it cannot work. But uh, what happens next, I don't know, right. because uh, most of the economists that, whose uh, opinion I actually am interested in, they haven't really made a uh, strong explanation or strong position regarding this. It's been very interesting watching that, I think. You know, there are definitely some very prominent monetary scholars who you would think would have made statements that would have, would have an opinion about mm -hmm. Bitcoin or mm -hmm. cryptocurrencies. 
but not so much sometimes. Yeah, actually, because Bitcoin is difficult to understand if you don't have experience with, with IT, I can understand how an economist might be confused, but uh, I actually would appreciate more if I, I, I value the opinion more or the position if someone says, I don't understand it, so I, I can't really right. explain anything about it. Whereas a uh, knee-jerk reaction, something like it doesn't fit into some framework, so that's bad. That, that's not really a scholarly approach. Right. Yeah. So it's better. But on the other hand, if someone bugs you all the time, you yeah, say something about it, say something about it, you might, uh, you might not be able to handle it, just say something. Yeah. yeah. So we've got an economist here, and I'm, I'm really curious. I, uh, you know, there are a lot of hot topics within the Bitcoin space right now. And one of the debates that's going on is the question of whether or not the block, uh, the block size, the maximum block size, needs to change or whether it should stay the same. And this impacts the total transaction volume that we're able to, you know, because if a block is a certain size and each transaction takes a certain amount of space, then you can only scale up so much unless you're increasing the size of the blocks. But there is some complexity to this. What's your take on the issue? Yeah, I understand that this is a... In a lot of these difficult topics, when I first see it, I think, ah, it's clear, it's like this, but then I think about it more and it's, uh, it's not so straightforward. So I think that uh, the, the core dev team, they take a rather conservative approach. And I think with respect uh, to, to Bitcoin, this is probably the better option. If you want to experiment with some changes like the block size, uh, maybe you can uh, create a fork that is uh, like has uh, uh, different features and you try to merge the trans transactions into that and see how it behaves. Uh, what was his name? The Peter, I think, the, the Belgian developer. In uh, the conference two years ago, he said that uh, they don't want to make any changes because a lot of people have a lot of money in that and if right. something breaks, then they're the poor guys who, right. who get the, the, the flag. And also what we need to realize is that a lot of these things can't be really figured out theoretically in advance and they need to be simply tested out and we need to see how it behaves in reality. Because it's nice to make theoretical projections and models and so on, but uh, it, uh, th there's a limit to that. We can't predict everything. Right. So I'm, uh, from this point of view, I'm a supporter of all chains to experiment with features that make them different from Bitcoin and to try things that we are worried to put into Bitcoin at this moment. Maybe we can integrate it later, but... Uh... Cryptocurrency versus Bitcoin. What do you think is the innovation and what do you think, you know, in 20 years from now we're going to be talking about? Is it going to be cryptocurrency or is it going to be Bitcoin? Or some, some other word that represents well, cryptocurrency? In short term, I think Bitcoin will remain the dominant one, but as time progresses, it will become more and more apparent whether Bitcoin or something else. The, I, at the moment, the differences among the Bitcoins are not so, from, from technical point of view, in my opinion, are not significant. And in that case, liquidity plays the main role. Okay. And Bitcoin is the most liquid one. I think maybe only a handful of uh, altcoins actually don't uh, piggyback on the liquidity of Bitcoin because they, they don't really trade against the US dollar even, they just trade, right. against, they trade against Bitcoin. The, yes. So this is, this is an interesting thing because on one hand it uh, makes uh, more testing and more changes uh, possible. On the other hand, it shows that Bitcoin really is an improvement because if it wasn't, they would be piggybacking on the dollar and not on Bitcoin. But can they piggyback on the dollar? Is it, well, I mean, it's that yeah. transition point. Yeah, that's a it's, uh, point. it's possible as uh, hypothetically if, uh, let's say, let's pick Litecoin because that's the next one. If its liquidity grows and markets build where you can trade Litecoin against US dollar, Euro, and so on, people start to accept it as a final means of payment in those situations where they normally accept Bitcoin, then yeah, it can shift around. We don't know that. It's just uh, as... Um, as uh, Bitcoin grows more, then it becomes less and less likely. Of course, there's the exception if there are some catastrophic technical problems right. that Bitcoin like... The escape like, valve clause. Yeah. Yeah. You know, what about improvements? You know, you talked about how 
how the coins that are out there right now, all but a handful, are very much derived from and dependent on very heavily Bitcoin. But there have been sort of you know pokes around. I mean, uh, Litecoin isn't a good example, but Primecoin might be. It does something that's meaningfully different. And one of the things that I've been interested in with regards to altcoins is the idea that because the penetration of Bitcoin is so small, relatively speaking, to the world population, if I mean, there's lots of room for altcoins that don't even have innovations in terms of technicals, just have innovations in terms of you know, finding new markets to introduce themselves to. And yep. instead of, you know, you see coins like Goldcoin doing this every once in a while, where they'll try to introduce themselves, they'll try to introduce cur- cryptocurrency, and hey, here's Goldcoin, it's the first one you've ever heard about, why don't you buy it? So, I mean, to a certain extent, if you have a big enough, an insular enough group, that could actually work, right? Yeah, I actually agree. I made the argument in this uh I have about one and a half pages about this in my thesis. This was long before this debate became became polarized, and I make the argument that uh, if something was to over overtake Bitcoin, it would either be because either it overcomes it based on the transaction costs, which are these technical improvements, or through liquidity. And liquidity can also be improved if there's like a special niche that uh, makes it more the altcoins make it first there, for example, or there could be a company backing them, for example. These are There are a lot of possibilities about how that can happen. But yes, it can happen. It just uh, as, uh, as Bitcoin grows more and more liquid, or even though that's, uh, I wouldn't actually say that uh, that's the case necessarily. Why as would you say grows, that's the case? Well, Why? Because uh, the, the metric that I use in my master's thesis that uh, doesn't indicate any decipherable direction where the liquidity is growing, but I only use a very simple metric, so that might not be representative. Other metrics like the number of merchants accepting it, the number of transactions and so on, these have improved, so that's also a something that you can interpret as liquidity. What I do in my thesis is that I analyze the slope of the bid and ask order books on Mt. Gox, and those uh, through the, the data that I analyzed ends in November last year. I didn't really look at it afterwards, but uh, it's it's going up and down. So there's no clear path of it growing. But uh, there are a lot of, uh, I would say, soft indicators that it's growing, but the real hard ones, the the, the more mathematical ones there, weren't there. Maybe it changed in the last year. I would need to look at it again, and uh, maybe I can do that when I have a bit more time. Yeah, when you have a little more time. So you just released your master thesis, and that was from the Vienna School of Economics, right? The Vienna School of Economics and Business is the official title. And I actually wrote it already in November last year, but I didn't really publicize it. I just put it. I just created a blog about three weeks later uh-huh. and put it there. Yep. Was that you? Was that you know? Was uh, was doing the research for your master thesis? What kind of kicked you into the Bitcoin space as a meaning? That was together actually because I had to do a master's thesis I, and I didn't really uh, pick a, a topic, but uh, this was around uh, May 2011, which I don't need to explain people who are familiar with Bitcoin what happened then. So then I decided, hey, how about I do master's thesis on this? So that's how it all grew together. Win, lose, or draw, even if it failed at that point, you still would have had you know, a good postmortem. Yeah. Uh, so I've talked with Jeffrey Tucker before about this, and I'm super curious for your thoughts. I am enamored with the idea that Bitcoin or another cryptocurrency could either be directly used as a, uh, as a national currency um, or could be used as the transparent backing of a fiat currency that is essentially backed by it and that would, you know, instead of having a serial number on it, would have a Bitcoin address on it. You'd look at the Bitcoin address and it would show, you know, uh, the total that's on it against how many it's issued for. So, I mean, people think that that's really far-fetched, but in the world that we live in today, I I just kind of, I'm wondering, do you think that that's something that could work, you know, even with the system we have now? I think this is a highly hypothetical issue. Highly hypothetical. I suppose it's possible, but there are a lot of issues here, like uh, it would need to be clarified what uh, how our transactions are processed. It would need to provide some way of uh, of moving Bitcoin users away from Bitcoin, not 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 replacing fiat users with the new fiat Bitcoin, but moving Bitcoin users. Because if you just replace uh, the reserves of the central bank and you continue to have a monetary policy on top of that and uh, the banking system that we have now, 
that might make it more uh, likely that uh, fiscally the state doesn't go bankrupt, but it doesn't improve the financial system that much. Right. So, but it's certainly possible, and also what could happen is that uh, Bitcoin gets included into the special drawing rights uh, mix issued by the IMF, and, uh, and uh, that this will be used as backing for fiat currencies. Do you think but that that's as how, good a solution? I'm not saying that it's a good solution, but I'm just saying that this might be something that the 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 politicians might consider if uh, they're faced with some bigger problems, like the collapse of the, of the fiat currencies, for example. So, I mean, that implies that Bitcoin could live alongside of, uh, of currencies in a way where it's being paid attention to by the IMF, and yet all of these other currencies still exist. Yeah. Do you think that they're compatible over the medium to long term? The, well, compatible. I would rather say that the, the state has a, a lot of instruments about how to make it sure that its currency is still used or that it can continue to execute monetary policy. And I'm not even sure even if, uh, if everybody's using Bitcoin, if that necessarily means the death of fiat. The, they could uh, simply require that uh, taxes are being calculated or are being paid in fiat and that you need to do your accounting in the units of the fiat currency. And that could hypothetically still keep uh, fiat money alive. We don't really know how exactly the, this works because we were never faced with such a situation. The, the most we've been faced is when the whole system collapses and people switch to gold, even though that doesn't happen that often. That was Nowadays that was more in the past. Nowadays if a fiat system collapses, people switch to dollars right. or switch euros. They yeah. don't, the, the, the a liquid fiat money. Eh? Right. People don't switch to gold. People so far haven't really switched to Bitcoin in mass. The problem with any commodity-based money, where you actually have the money as, as a commodity, it, you know, I mean, you solve the supply problem, but you introduce all kinds of costs. So Bitcoin is interesting, cryptocurrency is interesting, in that it sort of does both. It fixes the supply problem without incurring the costs of physicality and existing in real life. I don't know, there's not a question yeah, there. The, well, for, from economic point of view, what matters is how you achieve inelasticity of the base money, is that the production costs are roughly equal to the market price. Right. Yeah? And that does not necessarily require a particular way of how to achieving the costs. They can be with Bitcoin is just electricity. Yeah, with gold it's a different. It's the cost of, of right. physically mining and transporting the gold to bank or to to mint. But uh, there are also other approaches. For example, one that I find interesting is a proof of burn. This was developed by uh, Ian Stewart, I think is his name, and that's basically a way of uh, destroying one cryptocurrency and using that as a cost for creating a new cryptocurrency. So then you don't need to re-spend the energy, you can just spend an existing cryptocurrency as right. an input cost. Hmm. Interesting. We are in the middle of a kind of explosion in terms of mining hashing power. And uh, the, the, I, out of the, the hashing projects that I either tried myself or invested in, I think out of four, only one is profitable. And the three, <laughs> I either lost money or will probably never recoup the cost. And so, these are ones that are still currently live projects? Uh, some of them are. Some of them I liquidated. So do you think that there's a space in mining for anyone who's not able to invest five figures you know, on a like monthly basis? I wouldn't say it's really investment. It's more about timing. I don't think you really need to invest much. Even if you invest much, if your timing is off, you, you, you lose right. more money. But uh, I think this is now a highly competitive and highly risky endeavor. I, I, I can't really say who will be profitable, but uh, I think it's, uh, it's probably misleading to concentrate on the amount of money invested. If you're a producer of mining hardware, yeah, that way you probably can earn money because everybody wants to buy them. But if you're the miner, then I'm a little bit more skeptical. So you don't think that, so, so it's who you know rather than how much you can spend, right? Because if it's about timing, that, that matters a lot. Is, you know, and, and also proximity then also matters a lot too, because if you're in you know, Mongolia being shipped from China versus, yeah. this is a controversial topic, 
we talk, I, I, my continual concern has been that we are going to see a major centralization in mining because the manufacturing is centralized and because as the hardware is invalidated so fast, the only people who can afford to keep up, so to speak, are the people who can afford to make continuous investment. And so that leads to, you know, I mean, economies of scale basically come into play hugely yeah. when it comes to mining. Yeah. And it seems like that's not really ideal for a distributed network. I don't actually have a firm opinion about this. I understand the the problem that uh, on one hand we need to have efficiency and on the other hand we need to have decentralization and there's a certain level of conflict of these two interests. Uh, but I think over time as uh, we approach, uh, the, the manufacturers approach the currently technically feasible limits, then the produced mining hardware will become more and more commoditized and that will improve decentralization. But nowadays when it's spiking so high and there's, uh, they're making more and more efficient ASICs, now it's very tough and uh, there, there could be a temporary less centralized or more centralized uh, setup. But I don't think that over a long time this will last. Maybe if there are some problems with patents, like someone tries to um, prevent competitors from issuing com competing ASICs through patents, maybe that might slow down uh, decentralization. But over long term, I'm not worried about that. But maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. No, it's yeah. fine. I mean, it's again, this is this is a controversial topic. When I talk to uh, you know, when we talk to the developers about this on the core dev, the, the kind of common response we get is that now doesn't matter so much because we're solving the problem now, right? We're getting it down to the lowest common denominator, and then once we've got this, you know, commodity level hardware that's so cheap to make everybody can have it, then it'll start going into, you know, it'll go into your car, it'll go into your water heater, all this stuff. But it's a problem where you've got the beginning, you've got the end, but in the middle there's this like yeah. big scary blank. I, I, I understand this point, but uh, my counter argument would be basically that we don't really know what happens in the middle yeah right. we can be uh, worried about what it what happens yeah but we don't really know whether it will be good or bad so yeah? given how fast we've moved do you think right now we're in the beginning or the middle <sighs> i well based on my luck with the investments i would rather say that i don't know <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think with your investment, maybe that means the middle, because the opportunities were much easier in the beginning, you know, when, when there wasn't so much competition. And now, I mean, my gosh, you know, the explosion of hash rate has been quite impressive yeah, was, to see. I, just read, I don't know if you noticed, but there was a, an erotic novel or novella published about Bitcoin. Uh -huh. I, I just bought it on my flight here, <laughs> and the, the, it has some funny stuff, like uh, um, it's about a guy who ordered uh, mining equipment with... Uh, Mosquito Labs, <laughs> and it arrived like five years later or something. So uh, people are already making fun of this, basically. So that is one thing that we really haven't seen too much yet. And I've been a little bit surprised, i got to be honest with you. You know, there isn't a lot of fiction being written about any of these technologies. Like, there's still fiction, there's still, you know, cyberpunk fiction being written and all these things that are more in the future, but nobody's really writing about it. You know, I mean, I talk to writers sometimes. I'm like, hey, you know, they're, they're, they're like... I want to talk about Bitcoin because I, want, I need someone to kill someone and I want them to pay for it. And then I was like, you can use Bitcoin for so much more than that. I mean, do you, how long do you think it takes culture to catch up to a shift like this? Well, I, I am not really a specialist into this, but I think that the, the, the novel that I mentioned earlier, that's a sign of a beginning. People will start to, uh, to use this. And we really eventually won't notice that there is anything special about it because Bitcoin will be considered normal. Normal. Normal is a very interesting word. So we just saw the Silk Road probably meet its demise, and this came kind of shortly after one of its more out-in-the-open competitors. People are paying a lot of attention to this, but I think it's almost for the wrong thing. I think that if this had happened, say, six months ago or a year ago, then we would have seen a, a pretty major impact in the markets. But, I mean, outside of the initial panic, not too much happened. I mean, do you think that this is... that? This shows that there is some robustness coming into the system. Because, I mean, the same thing could have been said about Mt. Gox. You know, I mean, two years ago, when you were first looking at Bitcoin, uh, you know, Mt. Gox went through a freeze that lasted a week. And it destroyed Bitcoin. I mean, like, people were paralyzed and there wasn't anything anybody could do. And, you know, now when Mt. Gox has problems, people just 
tick the, you know, uh, exclude Mt. Gox from the price on BitcoinAverage.com. So, I mean, what, what is this progression here we're looking at? I think it shows that uh, Bitcoin is becoming less centralized, that uh, Bitstamp is a solid competitor to Mt. Gox, that uh, what is Black Market Reloaded is a solid competitor to Silk Road. Does it matter that they're solid competitors or does it just matter that there are alternatives? You need to be, it needs to be easy to switch, uh, uh, like the, the, there, there shouldn't be a vendor lock-in. When there's a vendor lock-in, when there's, it's difficult to move to another competitor, that's not really decentralized. But uh, now you, you can, even if your dollars are stuck in, at Mount Gox and you're really in the Bitcoins, you just buy Bitcoins, you transfer them out and it's done. But it's more expensive. It is, but... It's, uh, you can't have everything perfect. If everything was perfect, then everybody would be using Bitcoin already for everything. But uh, it's, a, it's a sign of improvement. We can't just think that we'll awake one day and every Bitcoin will be everywhere, everything will be frictionless, there will be no problems with banks or alternatively no banks. But uh, it's, uh, people are trying to figure out how to compete. They're trying to replicate the good things and not replicate the bad things. And uh, there's also capital pouring in, so this is basically competition. And even though it would be nice on some levels to have a full proper decentralization built into the system, having centralized competitors competing against each other is probably the next best thing that we can have. Are there any other topics that you'd like to cover or anything else? Yeah, actually I wanted to mention my uh, there's an altcoin which I find interesting. It's called eMuni. Uh -huh. I don't know if it still exists or I noticed that it was launched. And it uses a different technique than a blockchain. They call it a block tree. And it has the interesting aspect that it's, it, it's completely immune to 51% attacks. Mm -hmm. There's no such thing as a 51% attack with it. But it has other problems. For example, as if I understand correctly, it there can't be any mining in it, and uh, if you have conflicting transactions, then the address is blocked. This might be. This is basically a method of achieving of uh, preventing double spending. But there might be reasons where you want to create a conflicting transaction and override the old one. So people are trying all kinds of things. I think, for example, that. Uh, how the 51% attack is viewed or, or treated is a, a bit misunderstanding because we don't really need to continue with the rule that the longest blockchain is the authoritative. There are methods of how to, if you avoid this rule, that you can prevent or at least mitigate a 51% attack. So research of 51% attack, I, I consider that an interesting topic. I don't know how relevant is that. I just think intellectually that's, a, that's an interesting thing. Do you think that altcoins that have uses beyond currency, so I mean, a simple example of this would be Namecoin. Um, a newer example would be... Primecoin. Primecoin, well, yes, yes, Primecoin, but I'm actually thinking there's another one that has basically a social network uh, built into it, okay. right? Where you can... It's like a combination of BitMessage and a cryptocurrency. I see. I don't know that one. It's a new one. It's called Florin Coin. That's what it is. Oh. Um, and basically, it's, it's not that it's inherently a social network. It's that it, it, its innovation is it has messages built into it. You can put, I think it's a 128 character long message. And so with a message, you can do lots of stuff that people are already doing or trying to do with Bitcoin. It just then people complain that they're putting junk into the blockchain because it's not real transactions. You know, you mentioned that people that the developers are reticent to mess with Bitcoin because it's got people's real money in it. So if something like this comes out and actually works, does that mean that it makes sense for Bitcoin to implement it or it makes sense for it to be left to do its own thing and Bitcoin is this thing that people understand that it's already stable? We don't really know that in advance. I, as an economist, would say it's an empirical issue. It could be that it's more efficient and more useful if it's... Uh, a separate chain for a particular task. Or it could be that it's better to integrate it, but uh, I think Namecoin, for example, shows... Uh, I'm not familiar with the other one that you said, but Namecoin, I think, is a good example of uh, something that really has a utility and that kind of makes sense to put it into a separate chain. As an economist who spends a lot of time focusing on Bitcoin, why are Keynesians still winning the arguments? I mean, like when there, there aren't often arguments, usually it's just ignoring 
But our world, largely speaking, is still being run on Keynesian philosophies and models, even though they've been proven not to work over and over again. Well, economics is a very interesting field because it's probably the only field where you can have the same facts and two economists agree on the facts but draw com completely opposite conclusions out of that. So I, I don't know exactly where, where Keynesians are winning, but there are some arguments that uh, it simply fits better into the role of a central bank to have a, a theory that uh, explains that central banks are good and that they can control the economy and make it better. Whereas, uh, let's compare it with the Austrians, for example. The Austrians, all the branches that I know of, basically they say that this shouldn't be done in a centralized manner. So you probably wouldn't hire an economist to run a central bank who thinks that central banks are useless. Or, so it's self-preservation and yeah. selection bias. Yeah, exactly. Okay, yeah, yeah. I gotcha. But there are other schools which are um, maybe not that uh, widespread, but that also support uh, central banks like MMT, for example. That's modern mm. monetary theory, yeah. right? I, I'm not an expert in this, but uh, I, if I understand it correctly, they do support a system where you have a central bank. And uh, monetarists, some of them or most of them, also support uh, a way of executing monetary policy, which implies a central bank, because without central bank, there uh, you have basically competition in production. Right. The money supply becomes inelastic, and you can't execute monetary policy. Right. So, is there anything else that you'd like to cover at this point? I think that theoretical economic research of Bitcoin is lacking, and economists should take it more seriously. It doesn't. They don't need to accept it. They just uh, need to treat it seriously because a lot of them just treat it as something that uh, should be ignored and shouldn't challenge existing views. But what happens with Bitcoin in the future, that for uh, someone who's interested in research, that's not that important. The important thing is that it already exists and that already challenges some of our assumptions and creates an interesting puzzle to solve. It does continue to be a puzzle. Peter Serta, thank you very much for joining us on Let's Talk Bitcoin. Thank you for having me. DNS is the Swiss army knife for your domain names, helping meet their customers' individual needs since 1998. EasyDNS has been an outspoken critic of SOPA and CISPA. EasyDNS was an early supporter of Bitcoin, and now they are proud to sponsor this show. Do business with a company that shares your values. Get a 13% discount when you pay with Bitcoin. Go to bitcoin.easydns.com and be sure to use discount code LTB.